So I'm going to talk about today is how to use GPUs from Java. And I work at IBM Hursley in the UK. And I've been given a pretty fun task for the past few years is to try interesting new projects in IBM, see if they'll work or not, see if they'll fail, and go from there. One of the tasks I was given was to explore using GPUs for the first time. I'm going to talk about these sorts of things today. I'm going to share all the bad news as well. And you may even see a live demo. I'm going to tell you how to get started as well, completely from scratch. So there are a few disclaimers to mention. That's the obligatory legal disclaimer that I'm not endorsed by anybody. Um, and information is accurate as of when I did this talk, so less than a week ago. Again, some more disclaimers for you. I mentioned a hell of a lot of companies in this talk. Um, I'm not affiliated with any of those. And there's the final one, which is just for fun. I accept no liability for the I'm going to share today. This was all done on my development laptop over here and uh, went through all the mistakes in the process. Graphics adapters and changing the BIOS and crashing plenty. So maybe we'll get to see some of that as well. Experiments with lots of threads were done. Again, that resulted in my laptop crashing plenty of times. And messing around with a graphics drive on your only development machine at work is not a very good idea usually. What I won't cover is an in-depth look at the alternatives. So there are quite a lot of them. Um, I'm not going to talk about them in much detail. Those are worthy of their own separate talks. Things like OpenCL, things like TensorFlow, DeepLearning4j, etc. Also, there's uh, debugging and profiling. I won't go through too much detail there. I'm going to help you get started from nothing to using GPUs to get a speed up. And really impressive programs. So I get these weekly emails from NVIDIA. And they're always, you know, we're using GPUs to do these really cool things. You know, it's uh, combating asteroids and helping find, uh, you know, cancer, that sort of thing. Those are for you to go off and research for yourself. But I'm going to tell you how to start using those sorts of applications from scratch. And the Java basics. We're going to assume that you know all about Java already. So where is, uh, where is Java used? Again, obligatory slide here, but it's very, very popular. So at IBM, we have, uh, we have our own J9 VM, which is used in a variety of places. So uh, the mainframe at the bottom right, so the Z13, for example. Other analytics offerings, so Apache Spark, which I work on uh, as part of my day job for the past two and a half years. Things like uh, Hadoop, uh, Big Insights, WebSphere. Things that make a lot of money for IBM are all relying on a good Java implementation. So if we can bring GPUs to Java, we can get a knock-on effect as performance improves. And then a simple experiment here. Let's say you're just in Java. You don't use the GPU at all. Simple experiment, just to use uh, parallel streams and see how many operations we can do at once before it falls over. So there's a Stack Overflow question that I've used here. And the code is right there. And we're going to basically run it with that num threads changing. So at the moment, it's just set to 5. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to change the number of elements to process to be 50. So remember, we've got an array. Go back to this one. Um, let's say it's an array of 50 elements. And five threads, what happens? That's all fine. Took a while, about 10 seconds, with no problems. We're not actually trying to process things fast. We're just trying to use loads and loads of threads at once. Next experiment, 50 threads. What do you think is going to happen here? Then she's instantly really good. No issues at all. OK, let's, let's see, what, see what happens next. No element set to 50,000, number of threads set to 10. I'm changing the number of threads by changing the system property, by the way, for the fork. Uh, I'll show you how, how to do it in code. I'm changing it this way, uh, system.setProperty, and then uh, it's basically java.lang.fork.common.parallelism that I'm changing. You can make this number really, really big and see what happens to your machine. So we just go back to our experiment. Number of threads, 10. We're fine. 1,000 threads. OK, the laptop's getting a little bit noisy now. It's starting to take off a little bit. The fans are going. But I've not crashed yet. And then we try to a little bit silly here and do 50,000 threads. Let's see what will happen. So laptop got really, really loud. It was trying to take off. 
no native memory to create any more new threads. That was a big problem. Uh, I can't turn it or process. I'm pressing Control C over time. They do nothing. The mouse was stuttering around. I'm trying to click the X. I got no chance. The JVM is trying to be clever here. So when you get out of memory or an out of native memory exception, the RAS agent for um, reliability will kick in and try to create a bunch of dump files for us. And that wasn't very good, very useful, because I'm, I've got no memory to create them in the first place and we'd have been a big loop of uh, trying to create files that it can't create anymore because it's got no native memory left. Uh, LibreOffice crashes, what I made a presentation in. I lost uh, loads of work. That was good fun. I still can't control C. No need processes either. And then I have to do, uh, I tried to get a print screen, I pressed the button, and uh, that was it. I basically rage quit and just rebooted. So that was trying to use loads and loads of threads on this P50 laptop. What we can do is use GPUs to launch loads and loads of threads at once if we've got the hardware. And that's because we will struggle for what I've just shown you. You can't run 50,000 threads at once on your diddy little laptop like I've got. I'm going to tell you about the spec as well in a few slides. The use cases always share these common themes. So machine learning is pretty hot right now. Um, and so is this you know, cognitive computing push. And what we want to do is create models for machine learning as quickly as possible. If it's going to take a week to get back a, a model to predict, some, predict something, that's no good. We want some real-time uh, either model creation or real-time use of those models to get uh, good results back for predictions. So machine learning GPUs, really good fit. I want to get the results fast. I don't want to wait a week to get my results. I want to execute many threads as possible. The only thing is, you can only do it for certain operations, which I'm going to talk about today as well. Uh, large amounts of data. So there's no point in using a GPU if it's you know, a kilobyte of data, your array is tiny. I'll mention that later on as well. Like I said, great for machine learning. So if you're wanting to use uh, machine learning from Java, give this stuff a try. So where are the GPUs getting used already then? Well, recent press releases, so there's uh, AlphaGo, basically a Go champion of plenty of GPUs and CPUs as well. There's uh, this Titan uh, supercomputer of sorts, and CERN is supposed to be using GPUs, and um, this Yoke Ridge IBM supercomputer for quite a lot of money, and Databricks announced they're going to be using GPUs of Spark as well. So a few pictures there. That on the left is a Tesla card, and those are the ones that are a little bit different from those in your laptop, which I'm going to mention soon. There's also this recent uh, AI versus poker win, which I found recently. Um, so using 64 of these NVIDIA P100 GPUs to win at poker. And there's a recent Amazon announcement offering GPUs as a service. And these NVIDIA emails, I always get them. Uh, to be honest, I don't read them. They basically into the wrong little folder called NVIDIA. I never click on that folder, but it mentions some good things. So deep learning combat asteroids, uh, detecting road lanes of deep learning, identifying skin cancer, uh, lip reading AI, the life changing wearable for the blind as well. So you can go and find these in your own time. And there are lots more success stories. So what does make a GPU actually good? Let's talk about that. So there's my little diagram at the bottom. GPUs are more like these little ants that do lots of the same task at the same time. CPU is your, your stronger but more versatile dung beetle. So these are the strong guys that can do uh, the hard operations and different uh, branching code can execute that fine. But your GPUs are more like, well, I'm a bit stupid, I can do one operation at a time. So I can do one operation, but I can do it across many, many cores at once. That's what GPUs are good for. And we're going to be using CUDA in this example. And that's freely available. You can download it from the NVIDIA website. There's also OpenCL. And you really need to know quite a bit of, uh, bit of C and C++, but it's not exactly the same. So when you launch these things called kernels, you'll be using uh, these little arrows to launch the kernels. I'll mention that very, very soon. There are also drivers, by the way, on Windows, uh, Linux, and on IBM's power systems. So what can actually get what type of GPU? I'll say there are two main types. You have your graphics adapters, you can plug a monitor into. 
So the sort of thing that might be into this laptop, maybe it's an integrated card, um, maybe it's just a, a small, not so powerful NVIDIA card. Um, but memory amounts, maybe two to four gigabytes, it's not that much. Less than a thousand processing cores, decent clock speed, and these might be, again, in your laptops. What I've used is this laptop here. I'm running RHEL 7.3, you know, decent amount of RAM, 32 gigabytes, it's an eight core CPU, um, all XD4 file system, and CUDA 7.5 is what I've used. There is CUDA 8 now, I've used 7.5 here. Then you've got the, the big beefy cards, the HPC cards. So these are the ones you're gonna put into your servers to do um, your massive workload. So I might test it fine on this laptop, but what I really want to do is put it in a, a, a server with some Tesla cards in to get the best performance out of it. Way more memory, so let's say 24 gigabytes of memory, some of the best ones. More of these little cores called CUDA cores, so a few thousand, and the maximum performance you might get would be in the teraflops. So think of this as your own little, your own little supercomputer, but it's only good for certain operations. Not everything will be good for this. And you're gonna be limited as well by the PCI Express bus. You've got to get your data, um, basically from the CPU and the memory, so your normal RAM, onto the GPU, and that can take a while. And then you need a decent power supply as well, around 300 watts, let's say, for the GPU. And here's what you can actually do. So I've got my laptop here, and I ran device query, which you get with the CUDA toolkit. These are all the attributes I have for the GPU, and the key ones there, I would say, a uh, number of multiprocessors, a uh, number of CUDA cores, and the maximum amount of memory. So don't to care about most of that, just memory amounts, how many cores, um, and what actually is the model. This is a, this is a Quadro M1000M from my laptop. And then there's a bandwidth test as well. That's all about how much uh, data you can pass to the GPU, how fast is that. Between GPUs, it's very fast. Between your host and the GPU, not as fast. So I've got some little numbers there on my laptop. Some CPU information, so the, there's some comparisons I've done in this deck. Uh, again, it's eight cores, pretty good for a laptop. Um, I've got 32 gigabytes of RAM as well. So what can it actually be good at? Well, your data needs to conform to these sort of characteristics. You want to process loads and loads of primitives at once. So ints, longs, doubles, shorts, and floats. Um, maybe doing some matrix multiplication. Maybe you're computing a dot product in machine learning. Uh, simple transforms. Uh, finding a pattern, and the operations keep it simple so without any branching and complexity, which I'm going to mention again soon. So that's what it's good at. And then what is it not good at? Well, arithmetic operations as well is what a GP is really the best at. Uh, what it's not good at is data that's not self-contained. So if I've got to keep calling the GPU and going back again and back again and back again, that won't be good for performance because you've got to keep transferring it over the PCI Express. Then you've got the operations, which won't be good at either, and that is um, things that aren't to do with those and those are numbers, basically. So if you're touching any files, bad idea. If you're using the network, you can't really do that on your GPU, uh, not a good idea. Manipulating objects, creating new ones, for example, putting mallocs in your kernel or new, uh, terrible idea. Involving the object creation or throwing exceptions, again, terrible idea. And using threads for different instructions at once. I'm going to show you the kernel, a decent kernel, and you'll see what I mean by this. So how do you actually use a GPU? What are the basic principles that you all need to know? Let's just see, we've got one big integer array, and we want to process it some, some way on the GPU. We're going to declare a new variable. Uh, we're going to call it int star my data from the GPU. And we're going to allocate some space on the GPU using CUDA malloc, and we're going to pass it in as a parameter. So we'll do CUDA malloc, and then the address of my data on GPU. Remember, this is a completely new variable. You've got your own array. You've got, you know, 100 elements in there. I've got to go out of my way and say, right, declare a new variable, int star, my data on the GPU, and then create uh, some space on the GPU. If it's 100 elements, I know that int's got to be four bytes each. How many bytes do I want? It'll be 400. I'm going to copy it across using that command, create a memcopy. Um, with hosted device passed in. And then you're gonna process your data in a kernel, so a method on the GPU. 
and then you're going to copy the result back, and that's, that's all fine. No Java whatsoever here so far, by the way. That's just all the GPU code. Here's what a kernel would look like. So I've sent down, uh, in this case, I've sent down two arrays. I've got int star array one, int star array two, and I can access each element in my array using this built-in variable called threadidx.x in this case. That threadidx.x will automatically increment, basically, when you run it on the GPU. If I want to run it with 256 threads, it will start out at zero and go through to 255. So I can easily access array elements by using this notation. Global, what does that actually mean? That is a function we can call from the host side, from the CPU. There's also a device and host as well. How is the data actually arranged? I can access it. Well, I mentioned that just a second ago. Um, basically, it'll run, it'll run in parallel, but you can access each element individually by using you know, threadidx.x in this case. And a kernel will run on a grid, a big sort of a 3D grid um, with different blocks of threads. And I'll mention this on the next slide. In star, it's just a regular C programming. It's just a pointer to be used on the GPU. And that thread IDX to X will be auto incrementing to access your elements. What you can do, instead of posting you know, 256 threads only, or 256 elements, is have more blocks. So I might have um, 512 elements to process. I'd have two blocks, 256 threads each. So the more work you have, you want to increase the amount of blocks. And I'll show you that um, in a minute. So things to know. Multiprocessors, these are what's really important on the GPU. And these actually do, uh, do the work. So the more multiprocessors you have, the more threads you can run at once. Then there are, um, there's the kernel we talked about earlier. How many threads can I really run? Can I run you know, a million threads? Let's have a look. It's the multiprocessor count times by a limit. You find that limit with the device query program that I ran earlier. So you can't run you know, billions of threads. Um, here it's four times 2048 on my laptop. And then a Tesla K8 TM, so the really good GPUs, will be able to process many more. So 26 um, times that amount. So how much do I actually need to know them? So all kernels get launched on a grid. What is that grid? It's a 3D representative of how threads can run on a given GPU. And remember, all your kernels get run on a grid. That can have many, many blocks and many different threads um, per block. So you want more blocks for more workload. And the GPU functions run on these grids. And then you basically figure out how many blocks and threads you want. NVIDIA SMI tells you what your limits are and device query as well. So when you're running your program, how much memory you're using, I use NVIDIA SMI that says, you know, one gig out of four gig, um, two gig out of 12 gig, etc. So NVIDIA SMI comes with the toolkit. That's really, really useful. And a good starting point, I would say, is pick a number of threads, maybe 512, and just increase your block amount, depending on how big your workload is. So here's a little bit of Java code to tell you how to do that for yourself. Um, so let's say you know that that's blue. Let's say I want to process uh, a million array elements. I would say 2,000 blocks is enough. And 512 threads will do all of your work for you. If it's really small, it might be only one block. So you can use that Java code at the top to figure it all out for yourself. So this is a really simple example using only CUDA. I say really simple. It's quite a bit of code, though. You're basically going to have a, uh, a .c file, just a normal CUDA program this will be. And we can say, how many elements do you want to process? Here we just say, we say five. And then you've got a simple kernel that I've shown you earlier. Um, and we have the main method below. You've got to go through and uh, basically allocate an array and then fill the array with elements. And there you can see the CUDA malloc call, the CUDA mem copy call, and then the actual kernel invocation. The number of blocks in this case will just be one. And the number of threads will be 256. Bear in mind there is no bound check in here. So I've only got five elements to process, 256 threads. So we can get away with that. But if you were to print out what the elements are, uh, it'll have a big junk data or just zero, because there's no data yet in the GPU for those extra elements. Only the first five elements, there's only a five-hour array, 
have been copied across. So you should really add some bounds checking here in your kernel. Maybe it's just an if. Um, if the daily x dot x is less than elements to process, or num elements in this case, and you copy all of the memory back at the end, do your CUDA free, and you're done. That's what you have to do if you're writing your own kernel on the GPU. Java Scala, even worse than that. So what you've got to do is, we're in the Java world again now, and you've got an integer array on the Java heap, that's because it's called my data, and all you want to do is use the GPU to process it. Well, we've got to create a native method. You put no body in there, no implementation. So random native method you've created in Java. Then you've got to write the C code, um, or C++ code, with a matching signature to go with your native method. So again, it's gonna be a pain. Then you go to your CUDA file you've just created, allocate space on the GPU, so enough for that workload, and then copy your data all across, and then process it in your little kernel you've created, copy it all back at the end, and then in JNI release the elements. So you actually update the elements that are on the Java heap. At this point, you've probably given up on life. Uh, it's very boring, you don't want to do this stuff. Uh, this is going to take you ages. And then in Java, you've got your data that's been updated. That's the long process. We've made it quite a lot easier than that, though. Working example, you need all these files to do it this way. So I've got, uh, so it is a simple script to do it for you. You do a Java C on your main file with your native method in there. You do Java H, um, and then you would basically include a bunch of different libraries for J and I. Then do NVCC, which is uh, NVIDIA's sort of compiler slash driver program. Um, and you want a shared library. So I call it devox.so. In your Java program, you'd actually call devox.so with load library. So you can access the GPU that way. Then you've got to clean up after yourself, and then you finally, you get to run your Java program. Again, the Java library.path is super important to actually find your native library. And I quite often got a lot of seg faults, so I just did minus XRS to disable all of Java's uh, reliability functions, basically, to generate core dumps. So I only want one dump if something goes wrong. So I can use minus XRS in this case. Java code here. We've got the native method at the top I mentioned earlier. No implementation details, just native method. And make sure to process it. And again, this is taking, taking ages. So this is the hard way. Header file you'll need, not very good. C++ code, which corresponds with the header file, is all here. So again, you've got to get the array elements. You've got to then call the GPU, release the elements. And you've got to write the CUDA code, and it just takes forever. So we're going to skip all of that. Check the results. Well, it's actually, after all that work, um, we've actually added 10 to all the elements. It was a really, really boring kernel. I had to go through all of those steps. That's the hard way. Lots of pitfalls of this, by the way. Um, name mangling can be a problem. So you should use extern C, object dump. So object dump um, and those parameters are useful for figuring this out. So here you can see some name mangling going on for that addx ints um, function. Look at that weird prefix, underscore z28. Not good. We used extern c to resolve that. Then you might get seg faults, like some weird memory um, that you've, might either mal uh, you've not actually allocated on the GPU yet. You try to access it, you'll get plenty of seg faults. So straight away, bear in mind you're in the unsafe world now with, uh, with CUDA c. So you need to check all of your memory accesses, make sure your points are still valid, that you're using things like GDB, print Fs everywhere, not very good. So I added some prints here to debug this, uh, this seg fault. And we can see you get unheld exception, check all your memory accesses, that would be the first thing to do. And remember to call your kernel in this strange way. So, you know, three arrows, and three arrows left, three arrows that way as well. So, yep. Add, add a bound check in for sure, and check return codes. So all these CUDA functions can return a CUDA error T. And if you check its success, that means it was good. It can go wrong for loads of different reasons. Simple way, this is the easy way to do it. You have to stick to Java as much as you can. And there are different projects you may want to use in Java. So Apache Spark, let's say. And we get error checking, we get type safety, we get debugging tools that are really, really useful for us. 
Um, we get profiling tools as well. We get a nice uh, JIT compiler, we get garbage collection, all that fun stuff. And portability to an extent, if you play by the rules. And then the approaches we've taken, that I'm gonna talk about next. So we've changed the Java class library itself. We've changed the way the JIT compiler works. We've changed, we've added a new API called Creator for J. And we've changed Spark itself to use GPUs. Again, Spark will run in JVMs. So I've taken you through all the hard stuff so far. No more of that. I'm getting quite a lot easier. So you want to sort some numbers. Okay, fine. You can sort some numbers. Here's how you can do it. You add one Java option. You add the minus D flag to enable a GPU. And all this will do is the stuff on the left there. So it will say, is it big enough? Is it you know, bigger than, let's say, 25,000 elements? If it's one element to process, now nah, go away. Uh, we'll use the GPU for that. If it's too big, let's say it's 2 billion integers, and you've got, your memory is too small, nope, no can do. Um, is the GPU available? You've got none. OK, fine. CPU, you go. And then finally, after all of that, it will be sent down to the GPU, and you get some pretty good throughput improvements. So you can see here, um, around 10x in this case for sorting for integers. So sorting, not that exciting. But this is just making it easier to actually use. You just have one property, basically. Then you've got the JIT compiler modifications we've made. So the JIT will go in and basically uh, optimize your code from Java bytecode down to native, native code. Um, different stages of JIT compilation happen. So you've got the code level, which is uh, barely optimized. Um, is interpreted, and you go all the way up to scorching, so super optimized code. What we can do is look at your code that's in this format. So I'm using the int stream dot range here, and uh, I've got a for each loop going on. And this will identify this pattern in the code and say, okay, that looks good. Um, I want to find on the CPU, but you specified this option, minus x to enable GPU, and then we can generate the GPU code for you, send your code down to the GPU, and you get the results back. So again, we're making it very, very easy to use GPUs without all that hard writing the JNI code, writing the, he the header file, the make file, no more of that. So in this case, we specify our JIT option, and we can see what happens. I do have some numbers from that as well on my laptop. So this is all on here, and you add the option, and we get these prints. So I'm going to basically uh, multiply two matrices together. Um, so 2048 elements, 2048 elements. Let's see how much faster it is. So we're done setting up. On the CPU, uh, 42 seconds, not that good. You run it again, about 41 seconds. So the JIT's in a better state. Maybe it was only cold, now it's lukewarm, let's say. And then on your next iteration, the JIT will be pretty hot, and you go down to only taking one second. Again, that's on this laptop with uh, not a very good GPU and a pretty good CPU with uh, eight cores. So we're making it really easy to use GPUs. You get all these prints, and it even tells you which line of code are identified and sent down to the GPU. So in this case here, I've got a line number. that says uh, 139. If we just go back, you can see, in this case, 139 is the int stream dot range dot for each. So the JIT compiler has seen the code and optimized it for you. So actual performance numbers for anything bigger than that, I'm going to tell you about now. We're actually going to compare 160 CPU threads on a decent IBM Power 8 CPU. Plenty, plenty of RAM in this case versus one pretty good GPU. We're going to see what happens next. So this is the actual uh, speed up amounts on various benchmarks. So again, this is order of magnitudes faster. Previous one was around 40x. In this case, we've got uh, between, let's say, you know, 10, um, about 50, 100. Quite a lot faster than uh, one thread you might expect, but even faster than 160 CPU threads. And that's on quite specialized hardware as well, the Power 8 system. That IBM provides. Again, providing one JIT option, you're giving it a, a parallel for each loop, and it's speeding it up for you. 
So here you can see the benchmark names. So you've got matrix multiplication, you've got a sparse matrix, the Jacobi 2D, and Conway's Game of Life. Again, you give it a J option, it'll be faster. So what are the advantages to this approach? Well, you want to stick to the Java world, so you're writing all your Java code, fine, and then you've got a GPU in your laptop, you give it an option, that's great. You don't need to learn lots of different uh, new coding techniques. And what we can do is we can optimize this for you, as detailed on the right, generating PTX code. Think of it as a virtual instruction set for GPUs. And in theory, no code changes are needed by the Java developer. It's just one of the option. Now, there are quite a few um, other things to mention. We'll handle all your copying of data for you. And the JIT will take care of the alignment and cache management to optimize that for you as well. This also works multiple devices, by the way. So th the few limitations here, the GPU memory isn't an extension of the Java heap. So I've got my data all over here on the Java heap. I've got to get it all across to the GPU. That is a known limitation. You've, got to, you've still got to copy it across, um, and that's handled for you. The JIT compilable check it adheres to these criteria points. You can only do it for primitive types um, and one-dimensional arrays of those types. No scalar variable access. Um, no native methods can be sent down either. If you've got a lambda and you've got a native method in there, that won't work. It's only for doing lots of processing with integers, uh, longs, doubles, etc. And again, you can't be creating new heap objects inside your lambda to send down the GPU. That would not work. Uh, JIT-based heuristics. So we're going to only send it down if it's a big enough workload, which we can figure out. And this will depend on different factors that I mentioned uh, just then. And it's quite conservative at the moment. So if you've got any feedback, you can let us know. I mean, change the heuristics based on how big your workload is. If you're seeing better results, you can let us know as well. And then to observe if it was actually used, you can specify the verbose option, so that minus xj enable GPU. That will give you all those prints I've shown you earlier. I optimize this bit of code, and I send it to this GPU. You can override all the heuristics yourself using the enforce option. And you can actually combine them as well, but make sure you use quotes, otherwise Bash will come in and think uh, the line is actually a pipe. So that's how you can combine your options. And I would say just give it a go for yourself, and if there are any issues, you can you know, raise a PMR against us. Uh, our developer works, you can go on the forums, and we can answer your question directly. We're using NVVM, uh, Intermediate Representation Language, to generate all of this code for you behind the scenes. There's a second way to do this, the Creative for J API. So you've got a for each loop, that's fine. Now you want to do something a little bit different. What you need to do is write a kernel yourself. Remember that I've shown you earlier, you've got that global function. Um, so you write your kernel, then you create a fat bin, which is basically a fat binary using NVCC to build that fat binary. They need to basically load a module at the bottom here of that compiled fat binary. Then you can call your kernel functions directly from Java. And what you need to do is use uh, these different classes to basically copy the memory there um, or to create a buffer which will basically, if you use a code for J API, you don't need to write your J and I code. It's an abstraction layer. So you've got these different things for CUDA device, uh, CUDA stream, exception handling is all done as well, so you can catch a CUDA exception and say, uh, oh look, I went out of memory on the GPU, I tried to allocate a massive array, I've caught the exception and failed in a safe way. So you provide all of those classes, all there in the JDK, and that's all free of charge. So you can go to DeveloperWorks and get the JDK with GPU support today. How am I actually use the CUDA for J code? in this kind of way. So again, this is just pure Java code over here. And I've got my kernel at the bottom right. So you've still got to write that kernel, but the Java code here would actually work and load up that kernel and send your data there. So there's less native code to write than without it. At the end of this talk, there is a full code listing, but I would just say, uh, find this talk if it's uploaded online, and that's your useful reference point to go back to. May might this be useful then? Remember I talked about machine learning earlier. Um, this would be, you've got a really good Java program, all works well, 
I want to speed it up big time. You start using Creative for J or the GPU enabled lambdas to get that extra performance boost. Again, you need to do some profiling first to figure out which methods you want to actually optimize. There's no point spending you know, 10 hours writing a really good kernel if you're going to call one method that just you know, is done like that. There's no point. So you can use Health Center for that. Augs put you know, print lines and timers in a lot of places. You can change the heuristics uh, yourself for sorting, for example. You can say, oh, instead of 25,000, that's too many elements. Uh, 50,000 is better, or maybe you want only 10,000 elements, you can configure it. And I'll say benchmark it for yourself as well. And just be aware of these limitations on the GPU. There's only so much device memory on there, so you may need to chunk up your, issue, your problem into small pieces. So I send down the first 1 million elements, process them, send down the next 1 million, process them. That's not the best thing to do because you've got to still transfer it between the host and the GPU every time. But sometimes you need to do that if it's a terabyte of data, for example. You can get GPU to one terabyte of memory. What we can also do is improve existing projects. So I work on Apache Spark um, in my day job. And there are a few things that Spark's good for. I'll say machine learning, graph processing, um, and SQL-like syntax for data frames, many other things. So you can use it with things like Kafka for streaming. What you want to do is use GPUs for the machine learning capabilities in Spark to offload work and get a performance boost. That would be an end game. So there's different APIs for it as well. The main point to remember here is that the Spark stuff will run in JVMs. If you improve the JVM, you will improve your Spark performance. And what different algorithms are in Spark itself? So here are the ones that I know and have actually optimized a few of these. We've delivered the alternating least squares optimization there. So the way alternating least squares works, let's say you've got um, a table. And in this table, it's got user ratings. Maybe it's uh, all the movies that I've seen, and I rate them from one to five. There's also a genre there as well. So I might have, for example, um, I might have, I think I mentioned it on a couple of slides. Here we go. I might say, this is for, uh, for bands. I might say Adam, and then a cool band one, and then a rating, and then George comes along, and he likes you know, the same sorts of, uh, the same sort of bands, with the same genre, and then there is a new rating here, so a cool band four. How can we infer that Adam will also like a cool band four? You'd use alternating least squares to do this for you. Again, that's delivered in Spark itself. And this is something we can use GPUs for. So I'm just going to go back for a second and mention the other cool algorithms that are in Spark itself. So there are things you might have heard about today through machine learning. So there's alternating least squares, You're basically filling in a, a matrix of sorts for recommending products. Maybe it's an Amazon, maybe it's a Spotify. Um, or YouTube videos, then the different algorithms of clustering. So k-means, really, really popular. Yes, you can use GPUs for k-means. And then there are classification algorithms, like logistic regression. This is where you basically want to uh, plot a line of best fit for your training data. New data comes in, and you can see if it's above or below that line of best fit. A good case might be a spam detection. A more serious case might be for healthcare, it would be what are the chances of Adam having an adverse drug reaction with these different types of uh, medications. If it's above the line, you would say, OK, it's a positive, uh, positive, he won't have any adverse effects. Below the line, nope, don't give it to Adam, it would be a terrible idea. Again, these operations can be done in parallel and therefore a GPU eligible. So that's how alternating least squares works, just mentioned that. And you can infer based on old data um, what Adam might also like. So there's some issues here. Because what if you've got uh, a big, massive, loads and loads of data, and right at the very bottom of your big data set is something that you want to, uh, you want to infer. So I want to infer that Adam will also like this, this band by uh, Zach Zwick. It's right at the bottom of our CSV file. And the GPU's only got so much, uh, so much memory. It can only handle one gigabyte of data, for example. How would we deal with this problem? 
Well, the algorithm itself, uh, also in least squares on the GPU, will handle this for you. You actually can figure, you can chunk up the issue into smaller sections of parameters to say, okay, generate all the ratings for the first one fifth of the data, then the next fifth, then the next fifth, then the next fifth. You don't need to do it all at once. So we've open sourced the actual code for all of this at that repository at the bottom. That explains how to run alternately squares on the GPU for yourself using Spark. And our approach uh, is decent speed up. So this was uh, 12 threads on the CPU, taking you know, over 600 seconds, so 11 and a bit minutes. Compare that to using two GPUs, and it was around 140 seconds. So straight away, you can see it makes a big difference. Now, let's say it's uh, a solution like, I don't know, deep learning for j or maybe it's TensorFlow. Something that you need to use to get um, a machine learning model, well, the real value comes from using GPUs in the first place to get the results fast. Again, it's an open source, open source implementation, and we use two quite beefy GPUs, the K80 series in this example here. And again, all open source. If you want to know about alternating least squares itself, the full paper is at that link as well. And to use this, by the way, it's pretty easy in that you specify one parameter, which is the spark.mlib.als one, and then your work will be sent down to the GPU. So how did we actually do this? Remember at the start of the talk, I talked about the hard way of doing it. We did this at the same time, and therefore we didn't have access to uh, CUDA for j and spreading the word about that very well in IBM. So we're a pretty big company, and um, it takes a while for news from one department where it gets one from another. Um, and we figured out that these guys were doing this as we were doing Creative for J and the Lambdas. And we said, hey, maybe that'll be a good example to show off the GPU capabilities. And they said, yeah, sure. Um, can you test it for us? So I did quite a lot of um, testing, and so did they. And we ended up with this approach, whereby you write, um, you have to write the CPP code, the, the C++ code, um, we did this because it was only one method we needed to change in Spark. So if he was writing a big application of like 50 methods, Creative for J, Lambdas are the way to go. If it's only one method, you can get away with doing it the harder way, with the build script, with the header file. So this was done around the same time, and that's how we implemented it. And again, that's all open source. And in our packages for Apache Spark, you can download as well. So we've basically given it away. What can we actually do to make it even better for Spark itself? So this is sending generated code from Spark um, and changing the generated code to be a good fit for the GPU. So remember that it's only good for certain operations, so ints, longs, doubles, floats, um, arranged in a certain way, so let's say contiguous order. If we change the way Catalyst works, so the code gen optimizer in Spark, you can um, basically offload arbitrary functions in Spark for a map, for a filter, for a reduce, uh, for a sort, that sort of thing, sent to the GPU for a benefit. That's what we're trying to do at the moment. And I'm actually, I'll show you a few pull requests we've done to enable all of this. So this, the end game here is you've got Spark, you've got a GPU, great, you ran faster, thanks. So what do we actually want? Code that's able to use auto SIMD or GPUs. And what that needs to do is have these characteristics mentioned here. So data access in a linear fashion, um, no external method calls, not doing silly things, so not, you know, file handling, um, creating new objects, simple processing with a counted loop. If it's in this format, great, sent down to the GPU. So we're changing the way Catalyst works to enable all of this. A few issues of this, the way the data is represented at the moment isn't ideal, so we've got some solutions all below, which is a new data format in Apache Spark itself. What you want to do is generate code um, in this way at runtime that will simplify all your operations to arrange the data in that contiguous way I mentioned earlier, but there are a few challenges with that. And what we've actually done is got these pull requests. Quite a lot of them are already in Spark, a lot of them have been merged or will be merged, and these aren't yet using GPUs. So stage one, arrange the Spark code, it generates in a certain format. That's the stage one. The stage two bit 
is that we look at that code in the JIT compiler and say, that looks good for a GPU. I'm going to go ahead and optimize it for you. Turn it down to the GPU. You get a performance result. So we're at phase one at the moment. Pull requests here and on page two as well. And just by actually rearranging the code in a certain way, we're improving Spark functions already just on the CPU. So not even using the GPU yet. Some quite good uh, performance increases. What seems to me if I do care about Spark, what I mentioned earlier, which is just, you've got this machine learning library, you've got the hardware, you may as well use it. That's what we're delivering here. And this is ongoing work that you could then apply to different projects. So maybe it's optimizing uh, TensorFlow, or did win for J or other libraries, see if you can get them using the GPU more often than they are at the moment. Some challenges to of GPU programming, um, you are restricted a lot by the PCI Express speed, so you can only you know, send down so much GPU, send down so much data to the GPU at once. And uh, writing a kernel, by the way, is really difficult. So there was a project called uh, Root Beer, and in the Git project information, it says uh, expect to write between three to five source source code lines per hour. So writing the kernel might take you a while, and um, for anything that's non-trivial. The different memory types as well on the GPU, to so the um, shared memory, there's also texture memory. Um, there's an limited amount of registers as well. Seg faults are plenty because you're in the unsafe world now. You can just access arbitrary random pointers to random bits of memory. Um, there aren't many GPU developers out there compared to other programmers. So for example, um, in IBM I would say probably less than, 100, less than 100 that really know how to use GPUs out of you know, nearly 400,000 employees. Um, so if you know about Java, you know about GPUs, it's probably pretty good for you. Lots and lots of videos out there to talk about this to an extent for GPUs, but not really on Java and GPUs. So that's kind of why I'm here today. And the queue of SDK itself, um, that changes quite a lot. Um, but one thing they are good at is backwards compatibility. So I can use CUDA 7.5 um, with the same code that I've used in CUDA 5.5, which might have been around for you know, four to five years. So I would say profiling, you, know, you, should, you should obviously get doing it. Debugging, really quite difficult in a the environment. And what could possibly go wrong? Loads and loads of things, so you have J and I going wrong. You know, Java, your CUDA code, bad C++ code, that'll be a popular one. Bad design, your workload's tiny. What's the point of using a GPU? Um, maybe we should use Spark instead. Maybe it shouldn't even be in Java. Maybe we should just use C++. Very, very briefly, just, just to finish, there are lots of things from projects using GPUs in Java out there. These are ones you should be aware of. I would say OpenCL, you can use of CUDA, and uh, TensorFlow, SysML. Uh, JCUDA is an alternative. Did winning for J. Pretty good. Uh, NVIDIA Lab is like uh, CUDNN, Kubeless, and Thrust. And Apurapi as well. This is the AMD alternative for using GPUs from Java. How many in for time? Was that a one? Zero. OK, so I'll we'll leave that there. Different projects using Java are out there in GPUs. And we'll skip the debugging example. Long story short is that uh, couldn't use my laptop for a week because I basically used all the memory and um, but also seg faults. Are there any questions on this very quickly? So I'm going to be in the IBM booth in the exhibition hall. If you want to know about GPUs or Java or Spark, come and find me. Mm -hmm.